civic history. Today, we'll be discussing America's favorite institution, the Supreme Court, and some stuff about legal theory and famous cases, because you can't talk about the Supreme Court without either of those. So let's get into it. The Supreme Court was created when the Constitution was written in 1787. It was actually a pro-Federalist position. Anti-Federalists feared that the Supreme Court would become a tyrannical institution, that a national judiciary would be unaccountable and be a court that would punish people with no real recourse. Uh, the Federalists argued that it was necessary to have a national judiciary so that there were, because of federalism, that there would be issues that only you know federal courts could handle, and such and such. So let's look at the law that actually made the Supreme Court. The Judiciary Act of 1787. It's basically one of the first acts passed by the new Congress. So here's what it says. Essentially, the Supreme Court shall consist of a Chief Justice and five Associate Justices. And if there's four of them there, they can do court stuff. Now, another little interesting part about this is why it is five justices. Essentially, it's because there were five circuit courts, federal circuit courts at the time. So you'd have one chief justice and then one justice for each circuit court. This is, we'll come back later in another slide. So here's where's the first members of the first case. You probably heard of John Jay and John Rutledge. Uh, it's not the famous case with Justice Marshall, who established, you know, judicial review, but it held some things. Usually mostly it was treaties and disputes with Native Americans and among the early states. So another big important thing to understand with the Supreme Court is that its size has changed. Of course, you know, there it was, there it was uh, six justices, and here in 1863, it is sitting at 10 justices because they added a new circuit court, the 10th Circus Court. And the reason why it's at nine today is not because of they decided that was the best number or whatever. It was pretty much a very funny story is that Andrew, uh, Supreme Court justice died and President Andrew Johnson um, was going to appoint a justice, but the Republicans in the House and Senate decided that that would be too dangerous, which it was. So they just shrunk the court to nine justices, and it's been that way ever since. So here's how you become a Supreme Court justice. It's very simple, at least at the federal level. You get appointed there by the president, and then you get advice and consent from the Senate. There is no qualification that you have to be a judge or magistrate of the peace, so that is helpful. Though we've had a fair bit of Supreme Court justices who are just very famous attorneys. There were even some who weren't technically lawyers at the time either. There's a famous case of a Supreme Court justice who took some law classes. I think it is very important to emphasize that being a Supreme Court justice is more of being an unelected politician than it is of being a you know actual judge. Now, to be a, supra a state Supreme Court justice, it depends on the state. Some are elected, some are appointed, some are have this weird, like, Oh, you just get chosen by lot, so. Another big thing to talk about when it comes to America is that we have a common law system. If you're in a law school, you'll probably get some of this or take like a legal theory class in like college. Basically, the law in the United States is supposed, when it comes before a judge, they're supposed to look at the precedent of what's been decided before as opposed to say, just looking at the civil code, you know. It, that's the best way. My professor in college always explained it as, quite simply, here we look at what every other judge did. In Europe, they go all the way back to the Napoleonic Code. So here's the biggest power of the Supreme Court that they sort of made up for themselves because nowhere in the Constitution does it really give them this power. And there's been some debate, especially when the cart gets a little partisan, if this needs to be restricted. Judicial review. The Supreme Court has the right to see if laws and statutes and the way the law is being applied is constitutional. And this was established by Justice Marshall in Mulberry v. Madison, which is quite funny because the way he did it was he essentially agreed with Madison, 
but by, you know, he wrote in his decision, we've got judicial review, so, yeah. Basically, it was a way to keep the Democratic Republicans from packing the court as, or just disregarding it as they are Federalists. Though there have been, as the court was mostly Federalist at the time, though there has been times where the Supreme Court has been ignored, famously by Andrew Jackson, who said, let them enforce their ruling. There also is a power of Congress to restrict the power of the Supreme Court by passing laws and putting a little, like, addendum in it that this can't be ruled on by the Supreme Court. It's an often forgotten about power, but they've done it sometimes. You, I think most often it's used on budgetary matters to say the Supreme Court can't be like, uh, this budget is unconstitutional. So here's how a court case gets the Supreme Court. There's a few ways. Essentially, it's basically you appeal a lot and get lucky. You know, you could start it from your local trial courts in your state and go to your appeals court. You know, say that police officer who gave you a parking ticket really, you know, violated your rights. You'd go to the local trial court and you say, hey, but under Michigan law, they can't do that. And you go to the state appeals court, or like maybe, and you go to the state Supreme Court, and they go, maybe. And then it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. However, if you go that route, the U.S. Supreme Court really doesn't like telling states they know their they know the state constitution better than they do. Another way is you can go through a federal district court to the federal court of appeals and get the Supreme Court. You can go a very weird route and basically, um, you know, just fight your way through various trade and appeals courts, or you can get busted in the military and go through that way. Another way. Is if two states, if if two federal states, if two states sue each other in federal court, that's another way to get Supreme Court very fast. Or if there's what's known as an emergency brief, but we'll get there. So yeah, you may be going, wait, my state has a Supreme Court. Of course it does. Here's mine. There's Michigan's. It's a very pretty building. Uh, their most recent big famous case that they took on was saying that Donald Trump didn't have standing to overturn the election in the state because there was no voter fraud. Uh, so now this is something you'll hear a lot about is the shadow docket. This is their emergency quick way to strike down a law or a bill or whatever that they feel is unconstitutional. And it's gotten a lot of press recently because the shadow docket isn't made public. You also don't get to hear their reasoning on why they decide one way or the other, which some has argued that the way they use this court has used their shadow docket has made them a little bit partisan. So now we're going to talk about judicial ideology, which is actually what probably is the biggest thing that motivates the way the justices view a case on the court. So there's legal realism. I guess John Roberts would be a good example, as he put it. I'm just calling balls and strikes. There's you know, there's whatever, you know, if you argue really well, you can change my mind. He's also, I guess I would say a little bit of not really, this isn't really a legal argument. It's more of like a political one, but he's a very pro-institutionalist. It seems recently that Robert's biggest concern is that the court might be seen as, you know, too partisan and therefore being open to ignored. So... Then there's the living constitution. This is what most of the liberals in America's judiciary believe in, that the constitution should be applied to the times. It's a living document. Uh, there's a, many articles on it. Um, there's common good constitutionalism. This is coming, this is a new theory that's coming out of the conservative legal world, which is basically the supreme, the founders empowered justices to take the Constitution and create a common good society via a conservative legal view. Uh, there's a political article on this. I'll link it in the description. There's originalism slash textualism, which is you find the plain meaning of the text for textualism, and then originalism is you... The way I always explain, had explained to me was put yourself in the mind of a rational, reasonable person in whenever the law or statute that you're writing, that you're deciding on was written, and how would they approach it? Which is fun, because how do you know this rational, reasonable person 
isn't just like you, but living in, you know, 1803. And there's also been some arguments like, hey, you can make originalist arguments for abortion that are pretty sound. You can make originalist arguments for voting rights that are pretty, for federal voting rights protection that are pretty sound. But there's strict constructionalism. Uh, that's been kind of mostly phased out. That's sort of like you can't do anything unless it's specifically mentioned in the text of a law or the Constitution. It's mostly been phased out as, well, it doesn't work for a modern society. And then the final one, this is a very small opinion, but it does have some staunch defenders in the judiciary and legal schools and left wings institutions, as well as just, you know, it did have Supreme Court justice for a while, Thurgood Marshall. The biggest one, it's using the federal judiciary to establish good law and good, solid opinions that socially and economically and politically advance people. The way that I just always described it is, taking Thurgood Marshall's quote and paraphrasing here of, you do the right thing and allow the law to catch up. So here's two cases that can help us explore these ideas. The debate over uh, the abortion cases and Moore v. Harper. So simply, we all know the Supreme Court's disastrous decision in Dobbs, which destroyed any chances of the Republicans having a red wave last November. But that was mostly the originalist doctrine of when the Constitution was written, they'd have no way of use of arguing that the right to pri they would have no rational means of arguing that the right to privacy includes an abortion, except there are lots of people who said, yes, it does. There are people who would say, yeah, I'm sure you could find rational, reasonable people in 1787 or such who were midwives who'd be like, yeah, I think that you have a right to not have to inform the local magistrate or sheriff of your intent to get an abortion. The progressive jurisprudence argument is it's a bodily autonomy thing that like, yeah, it's right that you have the right to just do what you want with your body as long as it doesn't, you know. I guess the legal realist argument could go either way. Common good constitutionalism would be like establishing a fetal personhood precedent. Strict constructionalism would just be a flat two word, would just be a flat one word no. Uh, Moore v. Harper is the other interesting one. This one, the Supreme Court might not end up hearing because of the composition of the North Carolina Supreme Court has changed since when it was kicked up to the Supreme Court. But this basically takes a legal theory known as the independent state legislature doctrine, which states that the only groups of people that can weigh in on a state's electoral law is the state legislature or any electoral law. The federal government cannot pass a Voting Rights Act because only the states have the authority to decide who votes in their states and not the Secretary of State or the Attorney General or the Governor or the State Supreme Court, only the state legislature. Their, the common good constitutionalism, this was one of their first big, uh, we could do something here and use it as an attempt to restrict the right to vote to only those who really deserve it. Uh, is the progressive jurisprudence opinion here is that is ridiculous. No way the founders would create such a system or anyone would create such a system in the modern world that like, oh yeah, one group of people can decide who votes with no real check on that. Living constitution would be something similar, legal realism, something similar. Even the originalist on the court seemed a little like, bro, that's a little too far. Uh, so let's talk about the partisan court now. And this is an example of where a lot of people, this court case, started arguing that the court was partisan. I could do a video on Bush v. Gore if you'd like me to. It's a very interesting Supreme Court case because it also explained one of their other weird powers that the court has, that they could declare decisions not to be partisan or not to be precedent. But... In recent years, there's been an argument, especially going from the left, the judiciary has become captured by Republican partisans, and that in the judiciary, you can no longer get a fair shake, that 
the judges that are there are not true judges. They are Republican activists and Federalist Society people who are putting Republican and priorities and before what should be the law. So how do you fix it? Well, there's been a lot of debate. Some people have promoted the idea, such as Bernie Sanders, of returning the idea of riding circuit or riding cert, that the court would be shaken up and they'd send associate justices and such on, you know, to go and hear cases in the lower courts. And that perhaps if something were to happen, you'd get a different looking Supreme Court when it appears. There's the court packing plan. Uh, that would, you know, just will expand the court. Um, another common two that's been thrown around, one was thrown around by a law professor at University of California, Irving, which was essentially the Senate majority leader, minority leader, and a couple other high ranking senators would all get together and say, okay, here's the names of judges that we all agree are good. And then we'll tell the president we'll only appoint judges from this list. Another one was proposed by Mayor Pete, which was expanding the court, but then having five justices appointed it, appointed by the Supreme Court justices themselves. It's messy. Uh, another this common one was term and age limits that, you know, no one should sit on the federal bench for more than 18 years. Or if, you know, once you hit 75, you got to retire. Uh, there's even some old ones of maybe making the Supreme Court justices elected or making it lot based from the federal judiciary and the federal sub and the state Supreme Courts. Each of these plans has their own merits and their own weaknesses, but who knows? Maybe something will get passed. Uh, so thank you for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, share with a friend. I appreciate all the new subscribers. Bye.